Shalom, shalom, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to Kodesh Nation and to the ninth part of our teaching series, which is entitled Proving Paul. Proving Paul. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to thank you all for being uh, patient with me on this. I know it's a lot of material, but as you've heard me say in some of the earlier parts that uh, the book of Galatians, it's very rich, especially chapter 3, very rich in content concerning Pauline doctrine and things that we're able to try, things that we're able to test and examine. So in part 9, we are uh, coming, uh, coming to the close of uh, chapter 3, and there's something that I want to bring out here that I believe is of great uh, significance. Because in part eight, you know, what we dealt with, we dealt with the promise given to Abraham, and then we dealt with the, uh, the Torah being given, and how that actually worked hand in hand with the promise. It wasn't something that was contrary to the promise. It wasn't something just done off to the side, but that was actually a fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. And so... Uh, we had addressed Galatians 3.21 in part 8, where it says, Is the Torah against the promises of Elohim? Let it not be, for if a law had been given that was able to make alive, truly righteousness would have been by Torah. And so uh, one of the questions that we asked was that does the Torah give life? Now, uh, Paul says no. Paul says no, but we uh, we determine that the scriptures disagree. And so the idea that Paul is putting forth here is that the Torah is not able to give life. The Torah is given after the promise. And so the Torah was basically put in place just to um, keep the children of, of Yahshua all in bondage, you know, just to hold them in sin and and basically just to kill time until it was time for the Messiah to come. That's what we're going to read here. I know that's pretty, um, I know that's uh, pretty bold, you know, and even pretty harsh what I had just said. But when, when you boil it down, uh, that's what it amounts to, is that Yah was killing time and just keeping the children of Yahshua all under sin by having them under the system of the Torah until the right time came that the Messiah were to come to the earth. And so one question that I am known for asking is, did the Most High give the children of Yahshua all a Torah that they could not keep or that they would not keep? Well, according to Paul, he gave them a Torah that they uh, could not keep. But according to the scriptures, according to the Torah, according to the prophets, even the words of Yahushua himself, that truly the Most High gave the children of Yahshua all a Torah that they would not keep. It was our forefathers' unwillingness to walk after the laws and the statutes and judgments of the Most High that necessitated uh, us, you know, to to, um, to need a Savior, you know, to be sent. Praise Yahuwah and to redeem us with his blood. Praise Yahuwah. So it was the hardness of heart. It was the unwillingness. It wasn't an inability. And if that's not the case, brothers and sisters, then what does that say about the nature and character of the Most High? The, the Most High gives the children of Yashra'al a Torah that they could not keep. And so when they failed at keeping it, he just poured out horrendous judgments upon them, even um, causing them to experience famine where delicate women would boil their own babies for food, all for not keeping a law that they could not keep anyway. So this is these kind of things are Paul's idea of um, keeping the children of Yahshua all shut up under sin by giving them the Torah so that, uh, you know, just so that time could be killed until the right time for the Messiah to come on the earth. Praise Yahuwah. And if that's not what Paul is saying, then you tell me what he is saying. 
praise Yahuwah, because you can't get away from that. If you teach that Yahuwah gave a Torah that they could not keep, then you just can't get away from that. Praise Yahuwah, that it really maligns the character of uh, the Most High. Praise Yahuwah. But uh, the, the verse that I just quoted, uh, Galatians 3, uh, 21, what we're going to do is we're going to continue on from there because there's one particular question I want to deal with in, in part nine here. And so as we go on, verse 22 says, but the scripture has shut up all under sin that the promise by belief in Yahusha HaMashiach might be given to those who believe. But before belief came, we were guarded under Torah, having been shut up for the belief about to be revealed. Therefore, the Torah became our trainer unto Mashiach in order to be declared right by belief. And after belief has come, we are no longer under a trainer. For you are all sons of Elohim through belief in Mashiach Yahusha. For as many of you as were immersed into Mashiach have put on Mashiach. There is not Yahudi nor Yahwanite. There is not slave nor free. There is not male and female. For you are all one in Mashiach Yahusha. And if you are of Mashiach, then you are seed of Abraham and heirs according to promise. So brothers and sisters, the question I want to pose for part nine here, uh, the first question rather, is that has the scripture truly shut up all under sin? This is Paul's claim. This is Paul's bold claim. So has the, has the scripture shut up all under sin? And so, brothers and sisters, um, where I want to go next is I want to go to Romans because when we go to Romans chapter 3, this is where Paul goes into more detail uh, concerning his teaching that the scripture has shut up all under sin, you know, in order to uh, prepare us to receive uh, the Mashiach by faith. And so uh, he, go, he goes into greater detail in Romans chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 9. So what he does is that he begins um, talking about this by saying it has been written. But what you'll see is as we go through what he says has been written, that he's not reading from a single passage uh, of scripture that has been written, but he's reading from a collection of passages of scripture and stringing them together as if they're one statement. And so we're going to look at the different elements of uh, this passage, and we're going to compare it to uh, what the original passages said in the scriptures in their true context, and that will help us answer the question that has the scripture concluded all under sin? Now, verse 9 in Romans 3, it reads, What then are we better? Not at all. For we have previously accused both Yahudim and Yahwanites that they are all under sin. As it has been written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who is understanding. There is none who is seeking Elohim. They have all turned aside. They have together become worthless. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have deceived. The poison of adders is under their lips, whose mouth is filled with cursing and bitterness. Their, sweet, their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their ways. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no reverence before their eyes. Praise Yahuwah. Now he goes on to say, and we know that whatever the Torah says, it says to those who are in the Torah, so that every mouth might be stopped and all the world come under judgment before Elohim. Therefore, by the works of Torah, no flesh shall be declared right before him, for by the Torah is the knowledge of sin. 
So he uses this to establish his premise that no flesh shall be declared right before Yah by uh, the works of the Torah. And so, in other words, Yahuwah gave our forefathers the Torah, showed them what was right, showed them what was wrong. In fact, he even said, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live and inherit the land. So, in other words, um, so Yahuwah is telling our forefathers to choose life and not death, even though they really didn't have a choice, even though they couldn't have chosen life because they were given a law, they were given Torah that they just could not keep. Brothers and sisters, what kind of sense does that make? And so let's look at what Paul says is written, and let's break this down uh, according to uh, what was written and their true context. And so it says there is the first, in verse 10, it says there's none righteous, no, not one. And so we're going to go to Psalm chapter 14, because this is where we're going to see that statement. Or this, this is where we're going to see some of the statements that he strung along in Romans 3. All right, now, Psalm 14 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no Yahuwah. They have done corruptly, they have done an abominable deed. There is no one who does good. Yahuwah looked down from the Shamaim on the sons of mankind to see if there is a wise one seeking Yahuwah. They have all turned aside. They have together become filthy. No one is doing good, not even one. Verse 4. Have all the workers of wickedness no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on Yahuwah? There they are in great fear, for Yahuwah is with the generation of the righteous. You would put to shame the counsel of the poor, but Yahuwah is his refuge. Oh, that the deliverance of Yashra'al would be given out of Sion, when Yahuwah turns back the captivity of his people. Let Yaakov rejoice, let Yashra'al be glad. Now, brothers and sisters, if we were to extract uh, verses 1 through 3, uh, from this chapter and not go further, that I could see how it could be uh, turned into what Paul is trying to say. But if we look at this in context, that verse 4 says, Have all the workers of wickedness no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on Yahuwah. What this tells us is that this is being directed towards uh, a specific group of people. This is not being directed toward all mankind. Even Daoud at the very beginning says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no Yahuwah. So we see that this is th these are fools that are being addressed here. These are people that are wicked, workers of wickedness that do not seek uh, Yahuwah, who eat up my people as they eat bread. So uh, what's going on is there's a separation being made between my people and the people being spoken of here in verses one through three. And verse five is even stronger because it says, there they are in great fear for Yahuwah is with the generation of the righteous. Now, Paul's stringing along these, uh, these verses and passages to try to make the point that there is no one righteous, that, that you cannot be declared right uh, before Yah by the Torah. But there's a problem here is that, uh, that there is a generation of the righteous present at the writing of this psalm. And it says, Yahuwah is with the generation of the righteous. And so verses 1 through 3 in chapter 14 here is not making reference to the generation of the righteous. This is talking about fools. This is talking about wicked people. And so this is not a good passage for Paul to use in order to prove his point. That's why he had to uh, just extract a few verses out of this passage and leave the rest alone, because the rest destroys his premise that there are, there are no righteous before Yah, according to the Torah. And in the very passage he used to try to prove that, it says otherwise. So 
uh, as we go on, Psalm 53. Psalm chapter 53. Tehillim 53. Now, this is uh, very similar to Psalm 14. And we're going to read through it anyway. It's just uh, six verses. It says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no Yahuwah. They have done corruptly. They have done abominable unrighteousness. No one does good. Yahuwah looked down from the Shamaim on the children of men to see if there is a wise one seeking Allahim. They have all turned aside. They have together become filthy. No one is doing good, not even one. Have the workers of wickedness no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on Yahuwah? There they are in great fear where no fear was, for Yahuwah shall scatter the, the bones of him who encamps against you. You shall put them to shame, for Yahuwah has rejected them. Oh, that the deliverance of Yashua'al would be given out of Sion, when Elohim turns back the captivity of his people. Let Yaakov rejoice, let Yashua'al be glad. Well, we see even in chapter 53 here, brothers and sisters, that this is not a declaration being made uh, toward all mankind, because there's a separation being made from these people being spoken against here, and you praise Yahuwah because it says that Yahuwah shall scatter the bones of him who encamps against you and you shall put them to shame for Yahuwah has rejected them. And so we see that Yahuwah rejects the people being spoken of here, but we see that there's another class of people who Yahuwah does not reject. And that's the generation of the righteous. Hallelujah. All right. Psalm five. Psalm chapter 5. This is where we will find uh, the, the verses and the passages that Paul uses to try to prove that, that all are concluded or, um, all are concluded under sin. Praise Yahuwah. All right, now, uh, verse 8 of chapter 5, it says, O Yahuwah, lead me in your righteousness. Because of those watching me, make your way straight before my face, for there is no stability in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Declare them guilty, O Elohim. Let them fall by their own counsels. Thrust them away for their many transgressions because they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because you shelter them. And let those who love your name exult in you. For you, Barak, the righteous, O Yahuwah, you surround him with favor as with a shield. Praise Yahuwah. So, brothers and sisters, here it is again that uh, there's supposed to be no righteous, according to what Paul is trying to teach us here. But here, that those whose throat is an open grave, because that's mentioned in Romans 3, that this is talking about wicked people. This is talking about wicked people who persecute the righteous. And we see at the, at the bottom, it says, for you, Barak the righteous, O Yahuwah, you surround him with favor as a shield. That's the generation of the righteous. Now, um, I, I want to backpedal some and say this, that there is there was a generation of the righteous. How were they declared righteous? You know, one may say, well, yeah, there's a generation of, of the righteous, but they were righteous by faith. They were not righteous because they kept Torah. They were righteous by faith, like Abraham. Well, brothers and sisters, we've already been through uh, Devarim, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, and I believe it's uh, verse 25, where that when the sons were to ask the fathers in times to come about why, uh, what, what are the meaning of the witnesses and the testimonies of Yah, the things that they would perform, that the father is supposed to tell the son that Yahuwah gave us all of these, these uh, statutes and judgments and commandments, you know, uh, to do in order to keep us alive as it is this day. And it shall be righteousness for us, or it shall be our righteousness if we deserve, if we observe to do all these commandments 
and statutes and judgments before Yahuwah our Elohim. And so the Torah already tells what they did in order to be declared righteous. We went through Ezekiel chapter 18, where even the wicked man, if the wicked man turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, all his wickednesses will not be remembered anymore. In his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. So this is the generation of the righteous, brothers and sisters. They were considered righteous because they kept Torah. And so Paul is trying to use these passages to say that no man is declared right by uh, keeping Torah. Yet in the very passages he uses, we see the generation of the righteous. We see people who were considered righteous because they kept Torah. Praise Yahuwah. All right, Psalm 140. Psalm 140. See, we're looking at the places that Paul drew from when he strung all of these uh, verses and passages of Scripture together and said, it is written as if it's one statement made somewhere in the Scriptures when it is not. Now, some, Psalm 140. Rescue me, O Yahuwah, from men of evil. Preserve me from men of violence who have devised evils in their hearts. They stir up conflicts all day long. They sharpen their tongues like a snake. The poison of cobras is under their lips. See, there's another statement that was made in Romans 3. Guard me, O Yahuwah, from the hands of the wicked. Guard me from a man of violence who have schemed to trip up my steps. The proud have hidden a trap for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have laid snares for me. Selah. I said to Yahuwah, you are my all. Hear the voice of my prayers, O Yahuwah. O Adonai, Yahuwah, my saving strength, you have covered my head in the day of battle. Do not grant the desires of the wicked, O Yahuwah. Do not promote his scheme, Selah. Those who surround me lift up their head. The trouble of their lips cover them. Let burning coals fall on them. Let them be made to fall into the fire, into deep pits. Let them not rise again. Let not a slanderer be established in the earth. Let evil capture the man of violence speedily. I have known that Yahuwah maintains the cause of the afflicted, the right ruling of the poor. Only let the righteous give thanks to your name. Let the straight ones dwell in your presence. And so by that last verse, we, we know there were righteous people in that day. There were straight ones. There were people who were considered righteous by Yahuwah. Why? Because they kept the Torah. Praise Yahuwah. And so the people um, to whom... Daud was referring when he said the poison of cobras is under their lips. Again, these are wicked people who are persecuting the righteous. This is not uh, something to be used to say that Yahuwah has concluded all under sin. Praise Yahuwah, but these are wicked people who are uh, persecuting the righteous. Now, Psalm 10. Now we're kind of skipping around. No particular order to this, but as far as chapters and psalms, but I'm trying to go according to the order of the statements that Paul makes. So Psalm chapter 10, I'm going to start at the top. It says, Why do you stand afar off, O Yahuwah, hiding in times of distress? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursues the poor. They are caught by the schemes which they devise. For the wicked boasted of his cravings, and the greedy one cursed and despised Yahuwah. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek. In all his thoughts, there is no Allahim. His ways are always prosperous. Your right rulings are on high out of his sight. He snorts at all his adversaries. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. From generation to generation, never be an evil. His mouth is filled with with cursing and deceit and oppression, under his tongue is trouble and wickedness. See, there's another statement. There's another Romans 3 statement here. He sits in the hiding places of the villages and the secret places. He murders the innocent. His eyes are on the lookout for the helpless. He lies in wait in a secret place as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor, drawing him into his net. 
He crouches, he lies low, and the helpless fall under his strength. He has said in his heart, all has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He shall never see. Arise, O Yahuwah, O Al, lift up your hand. Do not forget the lowly ones. Why do the wicked scorn Elohim? He has said in his heart, it is not required. You have seen it, for you observe trouble and grief. To repay with your hand, the poor commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil one. Search out his wickedness that would not be found out. Yahuwah is sovereign forever. The Gentiles shall perish from his land. Yahuwah, you have heard the desire of the lowly ones. You prepare their heart. You incline their ear to defend the fatherless and the downtrodden so that man who is of the earth no longer oppresses. So this oppressor that is is being referenced here in Psalm chapter 10. Again, this is talking about a very wicked and greedy and oppressive person who is oppressing the poor and oppressing the righteous. So this is not talking about people in general. All right. Now, um, Isaiah 59. I want to take a look at Isaiah 59. As we go through Isaiah 59, what you'll find is that Isaiah 59 probably it, it it matches more closely to what Paul is trying to say, but it still misses the mark. Praise Yahuwah. And you'll see what I mean as we go through it. Now, Isaiah 59 it says, Look, the hand of Yahuwah has not become too short to save, nor his ear too heavy to hear. But your wickednesses have separated you from your Elohim, and your sins have hidden his face from hearing. For your hands have been defiled with blood, and your fingers with wickedness. Your lips have spoken falsehood. Your tongue mutters unrighteousness. No one calls for righteousness, and no one judges for truth. They trust in emptiness and speak worthlessness. They conceive trouble and bring forth wickedness. They have hatched adder's eggs, and they weave the spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs dies, and when one is broken, an adder is hatched. Their webs do not become garments, nor do they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of wickedness, and a deed of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they hurry to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of wickedness. Waste and ruin are in their highways. The way of peace they have not known, and there is no right ruling in their ways. They have made crooked paths for themselves, and whoever treads in them shall not know peace. So let me stop here. So we see a few statements here that uh, Paul put into Romans 3 about the feet being feet running to evil, in a hurry to shed innocent blood, and how that uh, the wasting and ruin in their highways, thoughts of wickedness, the way of peace they have not known. Praise Yahweh. These are things that were included in Romans 3. Now, this is more uh, talking in general, praise Yahuwah, about, uh, about Yahuwah's people, but we're going to go on. We're going to go on. Verse 9, therefore, right ruling has been far from us and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but there is darkness for brightness, but we walk in thick darkness. We feel for the wall like the blind and we feel as without eyes. At noon, we stumble at twilight in deserted places like the dead. All of us growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for right ruling, but there is none for deliverance, but it is far from us. For our transgressions have increased before you, and our sins witness against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our wickedness as we know them. Transgressing and being untrue to Yahuwah and turning away from our Elohim, speaking oppression and apostasy, conceiving and pondering words of falsehood from the heart, and right ruling is driven back, and righteousness stands far off. For truth has fallen in the street, and right is unable to enter." And truth is lacking, and whoever turns away from evil makes himself a prey. And Yahuwah saw, and it displeased him that there is no right ruling. Now, let me stop here. Let me stop here. Even though, unlike the other passages we read, even though this is talking about the children of Yashra'al in general, 
and the general condition of the nation uh, at this time. Whereas these other passages are talking about the wicked persecuting the righteous, praise Yahuwah. But what you'll see is that even though this was the general condition of the children of Yahshua, all look at verse 15 here, because it says, and the truth is lacking in whoever turns away from evil makes himself a prey. Why would that statement be made if there is nobody turning away from evil? Is that they make themselves a prey. So in other words, that um, again, we're talking about righteous people being persecuted by the wicked. They make themselves a prey. In other words, it, that um, they're a target for wicked people to come and mistreat and to harass and to oppress. And so there were people, even within the sad condition that our forefathers were in here in chapter 59, there were people who were turning away from evil. Not everybody was wicked like this. Now, it says, And Yahuwah saw, and it displeased him, that there was no right ruling, verse 16, and he saw that there was no man, and astonished that there is no intercessor, so his own arm saved for him, and his righteousness upheld him. And he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of deliverance on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with our doer as a mantle. According to their deeds, so he repays wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. He repays recompense to the coastlands, and they shall revere the name of Yahuwah from the west and his esteem from the rising of the sun, when he comes like a distressing stream, which the Ruach of Yahuwah drives on. And the Redeemer shall come to Sion, and those turning from transgression in Yaakov, declares Yahuwah. As for me, this is my covenant with them, said Yahuwah, my Ruach that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not be withdrawn from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, said Yahuwah, from this time and forever. All right, so we see a reference up here. It said that the, he was astonished that there is no intercessor, so his own arm saved for him and his righteousness upheld him. So his own arm that uh, the scriptures tell us that Yahuwah shall bear his mighty arm before the nations. Yeshayahu 53 says that uh, who hath believed our report and to whom hath the arm of Yahuwah been revealed. This is talking about Yahusha. This is talking about Yahuwah uh, sending his son. Hallelujah. But what we have to understand, brothers and sisters, is that even during the time that Yahuwah sent his son, Praise Yahuwah. There were still righteous people on the earth at that time, righteous people in Yashra'al. There was Zechariah and Elisheba that said they were righteous uh, in uh, keeping all the ordinances and commandments of Yahuwah blameless. This is when Yahusha came. Praise Yahuwah. In fact, Yahusha said that there is more joy in the Shamaim over one sinner that repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Why would he make that statement if there are no righteous people in the land at that time? And so I'm saying this, brothers and sisters, because Paul's using all these passages to try to make the point that there's no one righteous, not one that Yahuwah concluded all under sin. He shut up all under sin through the Torah now. So uh, in order to basically prepare them to be declared right by belief in the Messiah. All right, Psalm we're going to go back to Psalms. We're going to look at Psalm 36. Psalm 36. We're looking at each of the statements that Paul makes, and we're, we're going to ask ourselves in their true context, are they saying what Paul's saying? And so far, we've seen that they're not. In Psalm 36, it says, Transgression speaks to the wicked within his heart. The reverence of Yahuwah is not before his eyes. See, that's the last statement that Paul makes that there is no fear of Yah in their eyes. For he flatters himself in his own eyes to find his wickedness to be hated. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise to do good. He plots wickedness on his bed. He places himself in a way that is not good. He does not despise evil. 
O Yahuwah, your kindness is in the Shamaim, and your trustworthiness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, and your right rulings are a great deep. O Yahuwah, you save man and beasts. How precious is your kindness, O Elohim, and the sons of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They are filled from the fatness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of Chai. In your light we see light. Draw out your kindness to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, and the hand of the wicked drive me away. Where the workers of wickedness have fallen, they have been overthrown and been unable to rise. So even within this chapter, brothers and sisters, we see a contrast between the wicked and the righteous. We see the wicked, the transgression speak. Transgression speaks to the wicked within his heart. Reverence of Elohim is not before his eyes. That's the very first verse. Whereas by contrast, the, uh, verse 10 says, draw out your kindness to those who know you. There were people who, know, who knew him. And your righteousness to the upright in heart. There were people that were upright in heart. So again, this is, this is not a good chapter to use to try to prove that there's no one righteous, no not one, and by the works of Torah, no flesh shall be justified in his sight because we have upright people here. And I already told you what the Torah and the Nebaim say about how people were declared right before Elohim. Praise Yah. And so that answers our question, brothers and sisters, that in Galatians, Galatians 3, you know, Paul says that the scripture has shut up all under sin. So we ask the question, has the scripture shut up all under sin? And the answer is no. The scripture has not shut up all under sin. That's a lie. Praise Yahuwah. And so the, the second thing I want to deal with is that uh, verse 24 and 25, it says, Therefore the Torah became our trainer unto Mashiach in order to be declared right by belief. And after belief has come, we are no longer under a trainer. So it says schoolmaster in the King James. And so the, um, the idea behind this is that we were trying to keep the Torah, but see, when the Messiah comes and we're justified by belief or faith in the Messiah, it says we're no longer under a trainer. And so, in other words, the, the trainer is, is no longer necessary. You know, it, it's, no longer, it's no longer necessary. Now, I told you that for 15 years I was doing what a lot of these Hebrew roots and Messianic uh, and even even uh, Hebrew Israelites, what a lot of these people do in trying to apologize, P-A-U-L, apologize, or uh, trying to justify Paul. Praise Yahuwah, who are trying to give their apologetics. I did this for 15 years. And this is one of the things that what I used to teach is that the Torah is our schoolmaster our trainer bringing us unto Mashiach, but once we come to Mashiach, that it's like um, it's like graduating high school. Now we're in college and, and and we're starting to get our higher degrees. But you don't throw away anything you've learned in high school when you advance and you go to college and you um, strive to earn your degree. And so, in other words, you hang on to all of the Torah. As you come to the Messiah, you, do, you just come up higher in these, these spiritual things as you follow the Messiah. That's how I used to teach this. That's how a lot of these Hebrew roots and Messianic, Hebrew Israelites, that's how a lot of people teach this. But brothers and sisters, that is not what Paul is getting at. It is not. He is not getting at the idea that you come to Messiah and you hang on to all the Torah, and you just move forward uh, in the Messiah while still keeping all the Torah like you used to. That is not what Paul is saying. All you have to do is just read carefully through Galatians as we have uh, in uh, this series and also read through Romans. You will see that is not what Paul is saying. Praise Yahuwah. But and, and you have teachers out there that are trying to make it out like that is what he's saying. That is not what he is saying. And so 
brothers and sisters, what kind of sense does it um, make to say that the Torah was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Messiah, and the Torah was our trainer, and when the Messiah himself taught his followers to follow after the Torah? Praise Yahuwah. And so that's the second question is that, that what did the Messiah teach about the Torah? If, if the Torah is just merely our trainer to bring us to the Messiah, what did the Messiah himself teach about the Torah? And so, uh, of course, uh, we turn back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. This is the probably the most well-known passage concerning what the Messiah teaches concerning the Torah. In Matthew 5, verse 17, the word reads, Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the Nevi'im. I did not come to destroy, but to complete. For truly I say to you, tell the Shamaim and the earth pass, one yod or one tittle shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done. Whoever then breaks one of these, one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the Shamaim. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the reign of the Shamaim. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall by no means enter into the reign of the Shamaim. So there you have it. I mean, the one who the supposed uh, schoolmaster or trainer is supposed to bring us unto, look at what he's teaching. He's teaching that not one jot or tittle of the Torah is to pass. Praise Yahuwah till all be fulfilled until uh, the Shamaim and the earth pass. Praise Yahuwah. And then also, let's turn to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. We're going to look at what the Messiah taught concerning eternal life. Now, Matthew 19, uh, verse 16, it says, And see, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good shall I do to have everlasting chai, everlasting life? He said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Elohim. But if you want to enter into chai, to life, guard the commands. Keep the commandments. Praise Yahuwah. And so this idea that we come to the Messiah, you know, after striving to keep Torah all these years, we come to the Messiah, we come to be justified by belief in the Messiah, praise Yahuwah, and then we no longer keep Torah as a result. Like I said, I know a lot of you teachers out there are saying, no, that's not what Paul's saying. That's not what Paul's saying. Yes, that is what Paul is saying. Praise Yahuwah. Yes, that is. Now, let me say this. There are, there are some of these teachers out there that are saying that, um, that people are misunderstanding Paul because they, they don't know the language and they don't know the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic and they, they don't know um, Pharisaical thought and the Haggadah and the Agadah and these, these different terms and, and how uh, they don't know the cultural context and the historical backdrop. And, you know, because we don't know all of these things, we're misunderstanding Paul. Well, brothers and sisters, what about all of those Hebrews? This is back in Acts uh, 22, I believe it is. And they rose up saying, men and brethren, help. This man teaches all men everywhere uh, against the people, against the Torah, and against this place, making reference to the temple. Praise Yahuwah. And also that the believers now, that, that there are many myriads, which is thousands and tens of thousands, that Yaakov said there are many myriads of brethren um, in Yahudim now, all right, who believe, and they are all zealous of the Torah, and they are informed of you, that you teach the, the Yahudim among the Gentiles to forsake Moses and not circumcise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why were people saying this? Uh, about Paul. Praise Yahuwah. Now you can say, oh, he was falsely accused, but no, these are people that knew the Hebrew. Some of these people knew the Greek. Some of these people knew Aramaic. 
some of these people, these were people now that they, they knew the historical and cultural context because they were the historical and cultural context. In other words, they were there. They knew the, the Haggadah and Agadah and all this other just complicated stuff that you're supposed to know in order to crack the code and understand Paul's teachings. These people knew all that, and they had a problem with him. All right, the believers in Asia, they knew that stuff, but they still had a problem with him to the point of rejecting him. You remember Paul said, all in Asia have forsaken me. What did these people know that the majority of us don't know? We're talking believers in Mashiach now. Praise Yahuwah that as a whole rejected Shaul to the point where he said, all in Asia have forsaken me. So all of these, all of these, these um, hoops we need to jump through in order to crack the code and understand Paul's letters, that, uh, that's false. That's garbage, brothers and sisters. That We had people that, like I said, we had people that knew all those things back in that time, and they saw, they saw Paul for who he really was. Praise Yahuwah. And so it makes no sense to make it out as if the, the Torah is our trainer, our schoolmaster, bringing us to Messiah, and then we don't need the schoolmaster anymore because we have belief in the Messiah. Praise Yahuwah. Which is what Shaul taught. Because, you know, the big question is, okay, well, what did he teach concerning once you come to belief in Messiah? And then from that point on, what does he teach? Does he teach that we should keep the Torah or does he not teach that? Like I said, you go through this, you go through my videos slowly and go through the scriptures. Praise Yahuwah. And then you tell me, you tell me the answer to that question. But our second question in this video in part nine here was, what did the Messiah teach about the Torah? And so he taught that the Torah is to be kept. He taught if you want to enter life, keep the commandment. So it makes no sense of saying that um, the, the Torah is a trainer bringing us to the Messiah and the Messiah is telling you to keep the Torah. Praise Yahuwah. Hallelujah. And so brothers and sisters, that, uh, that finally concludes chapter three of Galatians and we're able to move on. And so we're going to cover, uh, we're going to cover chapter four in part 10. Appreciate your patience. Praise Yahuwah. You all pray for us. And uh, we're going to be wrapping up this series. You know, I know it's been long. I know it's been a long time coming. We're going to wrap up this series. We're going to wrap it up soon. Praise Yahuwah. And I just encourage you. I just encourage you that if there are some things that you don't quite understand that I have brought forth, go back through them. Go back through these videos that, uh, and go back through Galatians with these videos. Have your Bible open. Go through the referencing scriptures that I that I give in order to compare uh, what Paul writes in Galatians to the Torah and the prophets. But this is uh, a if I could ask one umbrella question, one overarching question to those who would disagree with me, to those who say, "No, you got it all wrong. You're falsely accusing Paul. You're misunderstanding Paul. You're not able to um, crack the code." in order to uh, uh, understand this great mystery that Paul's really teaching strict Torah observance, but you just, you just don't see it, you know, b because you're not looking at this right or that right or coming at this angle and this and that. Okay, those of you who disagree, those of you who, who, who don't believe that I'm telling you the truth, all right, this is the umbrella question. Th this is the question I have for you. All right, question I have for you is this, because remember now, Yahusha, when he instructed the, the 12 to go forth, he gave them all the same instructions, not only just to teach his people, but to teach the nations. Go into all the world and teach all nations, all right, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And so a true apostle is supposed to go forth and teach what the Messiah has taught them when he was on the earth. Praise Yahuwah. That's what a true apostle is to teach. And he instructed them all at one time. Therefore, they're all supposed to be speaking the same thing. Those of you who think I'm wrong, 
and you believe Paul is right, this is my question to you. Find me a second witness to his teachings. A man is justified by emunah only, by belief only, without the deeds of the Torah. Find me a second witness to that. Find me where Yahusha teaches that. Any of the 12 where they teach that. The elders, like Yaakov. Find a second witness to, to um, especially Paul's controversial teachings. A man is justified by belief without the works of the Torah, and that the Torah doesn't give life, and that the um, <clears throat> no man is justified uh, by, by keeping Torah. Find a second witness. Find a second witness. And as you search to find a second witness, what you're going to find is the truth. And the truth is that Paul is alone in these doctrines, in these teachings. Paul is not speaking the same thing as the true apostles, and more importantly, as Yahusha HaMashiach himself. Praise Yahuwah. And if you don't believe me, then you go back through the scriptures. You, you prove Paul for yourself, and you tell me what you've come up with. Because I want an answer to that question if you disagree with me. I want an answer. Where's the second witness to these teachings? You know, especially to his, his controversial uh, teachings. Who else is speaking this? Where do we find this in the Torah? Where do we find it in the prophets? Where do we find it in the teachings of Yahusha or the 12 or the elders? Where's the second witness? That's all I ask of you. Hallelujah. And so we're done with part nine and we will see you in part 10. And with that, I will say, Shalom.